So tonight's presentation, uh, Rod Riley, he was what I call a late bloomer to sailing. Uh, in 1999, he turned 60 and he signed up for a four day course, how to learn how to sail. And after the end of the four days, shortly thereafter, he got hooked. He managed to convince his wife that sailing was a neat pastime. He got a boat. And then by 2002, he got another boat, a much larger boat, a 32 foot boat, a Bayfield, uh, and named her Wind Dancing. And then that's where it all started. For the next 15 years, that was their home, their winter home from January to March in the British Virgin Islands. And uh, the way things happen down there sometimes, well, in September 2017, two hurricanes passed through the area and about, well, most of the boats there, including Wind Dancer, were destroyed. Now, Rod's gonna talk to us about before all those 15 years when he was on the boat in the winter, and uh, during and now after, and how he's recovering and resuming sailing. Um, different venue now, he's here at NSC, and his boat is called The Life of Riley. So, uh, Rod, I'm going to turn things over to you and uh, let you continue from there. Thank you, Park, for the introduction. Really appreciate that. I just wanted to add a bit more on the bio. Someone may be curious, why did I sign up for a course learning how to sail? Well, if it wasn't for a call of nature, I probably wouldn't be a sailor today. I live quite close to Andrew Hayden Park. And so with a friend, I went for a walk one day and we saw the bridge and it led over to the sailing club, which I knew little about. Any event, as I was looking at the sailing club and the boats and the dock, I realized I wouldn't make it back home because I had a call of nature. So I went into the club and I asked the receptionist, do you mind if I use your washroom? She said, no problem. And off I went to the washroom. And coming out of the washroom, I see this sign on the bulletin board that says, learn how to sail. And it had a tag on the phone number and you rip it off. So I just ripped it off automatically because I've been retired two years, and I'm always curious about things. Well, you know, they say about curiosity, curiosity kills the cat. The next morning, I'm going through my pockets, I usually do every morning, looking at all the bills, and I'm looking down at this phone number, and I couldn't figure out what it was. I couldn't remember, because learning how to sell wasn't a big deal for me at the time. I was about to toss it in the garbage, and then I noticed that's the club. That's the club learning how to sell. Let me give them a call, see what that's all about. Anyways, I phoned this lady on a Friday to find out what's this all about and what's the course all about and what's sailing all about, et cetera. And she said, you're so lucky. I said, why? She said, the course was totally full. We got a call last uh, 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 hour canceling. They can't do the course on Monday. I said, oh, well, I'm just phoning to find out Cut me off again. And you're also so lucky. He's the best teacher in our sailing school. Hmm. She said, why don't, and then I said, well, I, do you have any, and she wouldn't let me get into the question I wanted to ask. Is there any literature or something I could read what this is all about? And she interrupted me again. She said, look, come down this afternoon. We'll sign you in. We'll give you the cruising manual and you can read it on the weekend and come on the course on Monday. And so an impulse, I said, okay. And then I hung up the phone. I thought, why did I say I'm going to take the selling course? I said, well, let me check. I have nothing in my social agenda next week except two unbanked counselors. What the heck? Let's do it and get it over with. <laughs> That's where I came from. And it was curiosity more than anything else. It wasn't this desire to learn how to sell. But in any event, I took the course. And, and I used to tell people after four days um, out on water and sailing, I became a born again sailor with all due respect to uh, religious ideology, but I did a 360 leap. I was a land lover. I did 360 degrees circle. I landed on my feet again. I realized I'm a sailor. I want to be a sailor, I'm a sailor. <laughs> and that started off the postscript. So it's, it is interesting. 
It reminds me of John Lennon's expression, life is what you uh, do while uh, you are having other plans. Any event, uh, this led to my wife and I agreeing about buying a sailboat. And we were with the Lactashane Sailing Club and we had a Venture Newport 23 there with retractable keel. And we poked around on that boat, not too often. And coincidentally, that fall, when I was talking to a friend of mine, I'd been out a dozen times on the Ottawa River from the Lactashane Sailing Club. He said, don't you remember that our friend at the party? He's been sailing since he's 18. And uh, why don't you give him a call? Well, I couldn't remember the fellow he was referring to, but I gave him a call. And he's a retired community college teacher. He said, Rod, you're taking up sailing. Good for you. Let's get together over a coffee. Well, we got together over a coffee over two events uh, during the next two weeks after I had met with him. And he, he started to, uh, since he was a natural teacher, right? His community called a teacher, started to ask me a question and teach me. He said, look, Rod, we have a 40 foot catch in the BVI. So I also have a home there. Would you like to try it out for a week? See what sailing's all about? I said, well, just my arm. So that's, winter we went down for a week um, in a beautiful home overlooking the the sea and on virgin garda and uh, we sailed with them for a week and i remember my wife says well this is what i want to do this is what i want to do i said well wait a minute we've known a dozen times in the outer river we've got a long stretch to go before because i've been down here in the open sea and taking on the challenges that are there in any event uh, the the story is a uh, fascinating one. We got the boat in 2002. I was going to actually uh, sail it for maybe two or three years on Lake Ontario just to get my confidence up, my skills up, and so on. And coincidentally at the time, I went in to see a financial advisor and he asked me, what's your dream? And I said, my dream is to bring our sailboat, which you just bought, down to the British Virgin Islands in three more years. It's a great dream. He said, why don't you do it now? And I said, well, wait a minute, I'm here for selling advice, not, not to puncture my dream and my plans. He said, uh, how old are you, Rod? I said, well, I'm 63 now. He said, well, Rod, uh, my dad just passed away. He's 63. Um, he had a boat uh, he bought three years earlier and he was going to take it down to Florida. And now it's in the state here in Ottawa. He never made it to Florida. And that hit me like a thunderbolt. I come home and tell my wife, we're not going to do three years in Lake Ontario. We're heading down to the BVIs right away. We'll, we'll get our sea legs down there and we'll learn all the, the tricks of the trade, so to speak. And uh, in any event, our children were quite horrified. Uh, you, you haven't done your enough training up here in Canada. You can't go and sail in the open seas, Dad. So down we went. And that first year, we went down for four months. And uh, Jim, uh, the friend who introduced me to the BBIs and became my mentor, uh, we both did a flotilla cruise around the British Virgin Islands and, and the uh, uh, American uh, Virgin Islands. And uh, so we were, we were all set uh, for uh, coming back here the next year. One point I want to make, uh, right now. I was planning on going down Island Grenada and St. Martin and all that. I met another Canadian sailor. He said, whoa, 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 why are you going to the islands? Uh, Turkish waters, Turkish waters, Turkish waters. Sandy beach, Sandy beach, Sandy beach. The drinks are all the same. So when you found paradise, I never understand why people search for another paradise. He said, I've been coming down here for 12 years. This is my favorite place. What happened, of course, is I met a lot of Jim's friends when I went down the first year. A lot of them owned homes in uh, uh, Virgin Gorda, which is a population of 3,000 people in, uh, in Spanish town. And, uh, and then I met a social circle of sailors and non-sailors, and, and I really got to like the community. So the next year, I felt very much part of that community. And I thought, well, I'm not going to go down island. I gave someone my down island book. Uh, we're just going to stay here. And the, and what we did, of course, the first two or three years, we did a lot of poking around and sailing and going here, there, and everywhere and exploring all the anchorages. But after three years of doing that, 
we came down to the reality that there were four favorite anchorages that we liked. So the sailing started to disappear and we'd spend three or four weeks in an anchorage and then we'd move on to another three or four weeks in another anchorage. So in the actual three months, we didn't do much sailing. So literally the sailboat became, uh, don't want to be pejorative here, but it became a cottage in water. Uh, a great sailing boat, just great on a beam reach. Uh, that boat just takes off, didn't point too well. On a beam reach, uh, I could uh, I could make it to another island quite uh, quickly. So we got used to the lifestyle there and the community, and it was just a wonderful experience. And sometimes there were parties on land, and we were invited to it because my friend had a home in Virgin Gorda, and it just opened up a whole new uh, way of life. And we just uh, loved every moment of it. The other uh, point I'd like to bring up is in terms of sailing, this was our second down, year down there. I found that I, we both had a different personality down there. It was fascinating. I was not the same person I was in Ottawa. I was first of all a sailor, I was wind dancing, and we met so many other interesting sailors going through the BVIs. And our community consisted from people from California, from France, uh, from uh, England, of course, and so on and then people passing through on uh, around the world cruises, just a variety of people uh, made it just so fascinating and interesting. And, and the kinship that's there nurtured uh, ourselves. Uh, every time we'd be at a restaurant, some fellow would come up and introduce himself and we'd chat. And I met so many different interesting people, felt so much at home there. So it was just beautiful times we had there. And, uh, some of the aspects of it were, this is the routine stuff, drying the towels, right? Uh, and that's the uh, quiche. And I meant the beginning, my apologies, to introduce you to my significant partner of 52 years now and still going strong. Uh, uh, her nickname was given to her by her 18 year old uh, brothers uh, many years ago and it's quiche. And of course, everyone will say quiche Lorraine and she groans because she's heard that a hundred times. But nonetheless, it's K-E-I-S-H. And that nickname stuck with her uh, throughout her life. Her real name, of course, is Katerina. She was a, a Greek family in the Bahamas. She grew up in the Bahamas and came to uh, Ottawa uh, when she was 18. Her brother was doing graduate studies at Carleton University and I met her at Carleton University. So, and the rest is history. So I'll move on to now parts of what we uh, involve ourselves in. First of all, the, the, the activities that we, uh, this is the boat, uh, now that we're on the boat, uh, just a wonderful boat, uh, impeccable condition. It was in showroom condition when we bought it. Surveyor gave five stars on every item and it was well looked after, totally loaded, autopilot, radar, you name it, it was on that boat. And it handled very well. And Keish, of course, uh, took great pride in the kitchen. We had a small kitchen there that we were able to move around. It was quite compact. And interesting, it wasn't propane, it was the alcohol uh, canisters. And I remember thinking we may have to switch propane. But the alcohol canisters just worked wonderful for us. It was just one little two bowl burner alcohol stove. And I put in a shelf just so we had a cooking area. So that was the area that we both shared in. We like to take terms at our age in cooking. So that uh, was a, a part of the cruising lifestyle. One thing I did want to mention is we took out the table in the uh, cabin because we knew we were never going to eat inside the boat. We were going to have breakfast, lunch, and supper in the cockpit. And that's one of the reasons you'll see, uh, that's the cabin. That cabin there, that settee is about six and a half feet long, and it can go into a double and can sleep there. So what we did in the arrangement, I'm an early riser, so I'd sleep in the cabin and Keith would sleep up in the beaver uh, right behind the door. 
So when I got up in the morning, she's usually up around 8, 8.30, and I'm up around uh, sunrise, around 6, 6.30. And one of the practices I had, I didn't want to disturb her on the boat. So I would take off in the dinghy, but I wouldn't turn on the engine. I'd paddle away from the boat till it's a good distance. Then I'd slowly row up, rev up the outboard engine, go to the dock. And at that time, the Bitter End Yacht Club had opened their restaurant at seven. So I would go there with my computer, hook up the Wi-Fi, have a coffee, and then head back to the boat at 8.30, at which point Keish would be getting up and we'd have breakfast together. Should point out the picture on the advertisement uh, with the cup of coffee. That's a breakfast time. Now, as you well know, coffee is a, affects your hydration, it's a diuretic. And so in the very hot weather, we just allow ourselves the two cups of coffee in the morning and certainly wouldn't drink coffee the rest of the day. The boat handled well. The, the company in Toronto did all the bimini's for us and I had every cover you'd ever imagine the boat, side covers, back covers. And the traveler, I had to get two independent bimini's and then I could just uh, run the uh, traveler here, I was motoring, but I could run the uh, traveler through the split in the two bimmies, but when I wasn't sailing, I could zipper in the other panel and it was totally covered because you do that under anchorage. So Keith really enjoyed the challenges down there. Uh, we had just such wonderful times and not just the sailing, but the people we met and then the community that we hung out with. It was just a, a great experience for us. We really loved every moment and of course, the weather is so cooperative down there. What's fascinating about the British Virgin Islands, turquoise water, I just love it. What's fascinating about the British Virgin Islands is the narrow range of variation in the temperature. And the first three weeks, it was 25 to 29, 25 to 30, 25 to 29. So at a happy hour one day, I said, I think my thermometer stuck at 25. Or every morning it's 25, uh, something wrong. So it's nothing wrong, that's normal. So what do you mean? 90% of the time, Rod, is 25 in the morning. Sometimes 24, sometimes 26, but 95% of the time it's 25 in the morning. That's uncanny from a guy from Ottawa. I never heard of that in my life, right? So that was the weather range for us while we were down there, 25 to 29, 90% of the time. And that was a, a Botex uh, dinghy made here in Canada. You're probably familiar with it, a 10 footer uh, uh, glass dinghy. And that's my family when they were younger, uh, the two grandchildren and my two daughters. And they visited us over the 15 years there about uh, uh, three times, I believe, maybe four times, and got introduced to it. Um, one of my daughter was very susceptible to uh, motion sickness. So it was difficult for her at times to put it off with a rocky poly boat, but we made adjustments on that. And that's the gang coming down a uh, number of some when the kids were a little older and my two daughters there with the grandchildren getting bigger and bigger. And right now the two grandchildren are quite big. Uh, my granddaughter is now at McGill in her second year uh, environmental studies and biology, I believe. And my grandson's just finishing his, uh, his uh, uh, community college uh, program and will be going to university next year. So that uh, is where we were at. And what I want to say is what I discovered there, and you can see the shield, I had a back shield. But one thing you're down there, the sun is unforgiving. And you can't eat in the cockpit if you're going to have sun burning down your back. So you have to have the side covers. And we're able to, uh, to eat it uh, all year round. I had one on uh, the stern part. And in pouring rain, I had another panel flight right to the Dodger, and I could sit there in pouring rain an hour or supper. So we never ate out anywhere else. We lived in, I used to call it our tent in the cockpit. That's where we lived. Now, I should mention that what started to transpire, there's a relaxing picture of uh, Keish taking in the panoramic view at one of the islands that we were at. We were actually in the marina at that time, I recall, and um, my daughter was visiting us, and 
This was the R and R uh, times, and you have lots of that on your cruisers. Interesting, the cruiser community is quite a diverse community. It's like the whole sailing community. We're all diverse, in so many respects. Uh, cruising is really about uh, living on a boat. And what I discovered after many years, this is uh, <laughs> my younger daughter of the sea fan she found somewhere, balanced it on her head. But what I found over the years, it wasn't about living on a boat. It was about living on water, living on water. I could be in Trollope, but living on water, I totaled it up for almost now uh, three and a half years, I was living on water. And that affected me profoundly. And what happened when I first went down, it takes two or three days to hit my sea legs. But surprise, surprise, when I used to come home after three and a half months of 24 seven living on water, used to continual motion. I get up in the morning, I wouldn't have my land legs. And the floor was so rigid and static and it didn't move, it had no rhythm. I'd almost trip going to the washroom. I couldn't get used to the jerky motion when you walk because in a the boat, there's no jerks. It's, it's all rhythmic. You're always, there's always rhythm in a boat. You're moving and so on. So there was an adaptation when I came back the first two or three days to get my land legs back in bed. And then I said, I prefer having sea legs. I love the motion, continual motion. And when you think of it, uh, it's a natural uh, motion when one considers the reality that 70% uh, of the planet is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, 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 70% of the planet is water covered, right? So only 30% is land. And of that, 97% uh, of the water is in the ocean. So that leaves 3% for the lakes and the rivers and so on. So you get the scale of things there. And what I found was I developed this deep uh, relationship with the water. I can't really put it into um, any details. Maybe I'll play amateur psychologist here. We started off as homo sapiens, I believe, as bacteria, viruses, and parasites evolved to fish. So we have an ancestry of fish in ourselves. So living on water is a very natural thing to do because it ties into your genetic ancestry. That's a picture of one of our popular anchorages at the Bitter End Yacht Club, a very famous yacht club. And, and there's anchorage and moon falls for probably uh, at least 200 boats, a very popular place. We did a lot of, um, in terms of exercise, we did a lot of swimming. I always swam around the boat every day, check it out, and watch out for the barracudas. <laughs> they just stare at you, I found out, but a lot of them would be taking some shade under your keel and they'd look you in the eye, but they wouldn't do anything else. That's on the top, we finally, climbed up the hill to the top and that's a panoramic view. And so those uh, tours we make up the mountainside, they took us about two hours uh, when we did them and we did them quite often. We tried different uh, uh, routes and so, so on. So there was a lot of activity. This is one yoga class I couldn't believe it doing on these uh, boards, right? It was uh, at the Bitter and Yacht Club in the morning. How they could balance and do yoga postures on a board was truly amazing. So I had to take a picture. But there are all kinds of activities going on down there. And the Bitter End Yacht Club had a, oh, um, well, this here is what's our favorite restaurant, uh, Marina Key. And I think during one season, we'd eat the, down there about uh, oh, seven or eight times. So it was so, the food was so great. The, the atmosphere is so great, the views are so great, great anchorages and so on. So I think in the 15 years there, we were up to about 75. They used to feed a, a foot long hot dog. <laughs> that was uh, something else, but it was more of a novelty than anything else, quite delicious. But they made incredible uh, uh, dishes, uh, salads and uh, other fish uh, dinners. And they made uh, a, a painkiller. I'm not sure if 
you're familiar with the painkiller drink, but it's a mix of juices and coconut juice and other juices and rum. And I remember when I first had my painkiller there, they said, do you want a single, a double, or a triple? I said, well, I'll start with a single. And I had the single, and I thought, they'd have to carry me out of this club if I had a double or a triple. <laughs> the single just knocked me out, I'm telling it. Anyway, it became one of my favorite drinks down there. This is the boat going away now for the season, back into the yard. The boat weighs about 12,000 pounds. It's a long keel. Long keels are great, especially in a beam reach, but uh, they're not much fun trying to back up into a, a slip. Now, there are lots of iguanas down there, and uh, they probably, they're four feet long, three feet, four feet long, and so they're very friendly creatures, I found out. But one morning, I was ashore by myself, and I was sitting just at a dock on a bench, and I had put my glass case down on the floor, and I was checking my emails. And at one point, I looked down, and there was an iguana about three inches from my toes. <laughs> of course, I jumped up. I go, oh, my God, I'm getting out. He went back to the boat. Well, it turned out. Some sailors said, what color was your glass case that you put down, Rod? I said, it was red. I had a red glass case, so I could always find it. They said, they love reds. <laughs> Any color red, they go towards it. So I switched to black uh, cases after that. So that brings us to the mood we were going in down there and the uh, islands we visited and so on were just... Uh, pristinely beautiful. The security down the British Virgin Islands, another point is just probably one of the safest islands in all the islands in the Caribbean. Just a great place to be. You feel so secure in Virgin Gorda. I know when I was working on the boat in the yard and went down to the restaurant at 11 o'clock at night, the street lights are dark down to the restaurant. There's no problem, no problem at all. It's just a friendly place. That's running around in the dinghy, like to show off sometimes. <laughs> All varieties of boats down there. Our boat, of course, in the cruising community is considered a small boat. And there's the rowing sign. That's how I rowed in the morning before I turned on the engine so I wouldn't wake up at the beach. We were going to visit a friend on his boat for uh, dinner that night. But what I found is, uh, just a wonderful place. The snorkeling's great. We did a lot of snorkeling, uh, lovely snorkeling areas, uh, pristine water. And uh, I remember one point going to see this wreckage, I forget the name of the wreckage now, but uh, I thought it was maybe 50 feet deep. And then I was looking down at it, the water's crystal clear, and I saw this little, little, almost ant-sized creatures. And I realized it was a guy with a scuba tank. Then I found out later it was 200 feet deep, but I wasn't used to seeing something 200 feet deep. I figured it had to be 50 until I saw this ant-like figure who happened to be a, a scuba diver <laughs> down there with his tanks. So that's uh, uh, another uh, fascinating aspect of snorkeling there. You don't need a scuba tank. You can see everything 200 feet down right on top of the water. There's the Canadian flag. Uh, and it's interesting down there, it's good to have these flags because you have other Canadians coming up to you and asking you where you're from and you see their flags and so on. And of course, there's just a plethora of so many different flags and so many different people in the British Virgin Islands. And also in a day with a lot of characters, a lot of eccentrics, a lot of uh, diverse characters. And uh, it was always amusing uh, meeting a lot of them. Now, in terms of the mooring balls, uh, they're expensive. They're $30 a night. Now, if you're down there for three months, it's still expensive. So what we would do periodically is for coming into an anchorage, we didn't see an anchorage we liked, we'd take the mooring ball and check the lay of the land the next morning. A lot of cases, some of the anchorages would become vacant and then we'd get off the mooring ball and go and anchor in a, a more ideal location. Because you get in there too late, there's no 
good anchorages left. So you got to move the ball for the night. So most of the times we're, we're anchored, uh, the say 90% of the times we're anchored, which saves us a lot of money, kind of expensive. If we knew there was a vicious storm coming through the, uh, the BVIs, we would pick up a morning ball because well, one night we were in a storm and everyone was dragging anchor and it was just a nightmare in that storm, ourselves included. And so in future, uh, if there was a real storm coming up, didn't happen too often down there. Uh, on average, maybe three storms during the three months we're down there and we'd uh, take a morning ball just to be in the safe side. Okay, starting this is the Gee Trail going to the top of the uh, the Virgin Gorda uh, uh, North Sound uh, Mountain, rather North Sound. You start at the bottom, and we saw the uh, picture up there uh, at, when we were at the top, overlooking all the boats in uh, North Sound at the Bitter and Yacht Club. That was quite a hike. I had to rest uh, twice on the hike up, and uh, Keith could do it all the way up without stopping. But I tell her. One third of the way, let's just rest for a few moments now. And then we get another two thirds, let me catch my breath, rest for a few moments now. But she would go up with a friend of hers sometimes and uh, and they just do it in, in uh, uh, one run up there, right? <laughs> it humbled me, that's for sure. That's the top view from the top of the, uh, the mountainside in uh, Virgin Gorda. And that, by the way, is one of our other favorite restaurants called Sabra Rock. You'll see a, a better picture of it down there. But a lot of us used to congregate there at Sabra Rock for a get together. And that uh, there's the, and it's right on the water. You could, you, your, your uh, table, you can see right on the water that you just took with your dinghy there. And uh, for rendezvous, so we get a call one day saying, we're all heading down to Sabra Rock. Uh, you want to join us? So we figured, well, it's in the morning, that's a two hour sail, sure, let's go. And so we end up with maybe 12 people who just sailed up there and we get together and just to the rag and talk about everything that's happening and catch up with the local gossip and so on. And great foods and uh, just a great ambience, really lovely place. It really got wrecked in the hurricane, which I'll get to much later, but it just a, uh, and Bukovillis, if you like Bukovillis, they're all over the place down in the British Virgin Islands. It's uh, <laughs> Bukovillia paradise. I should mention too, the Bitter End Yacht Club has a walk and it's inundated with all kinds of flowers and shrubs you could ever dream of. It's a long walk too. It must be approximately uh, about a 15 minute walk. And it's just beautifully landscaped. And at one end of the, uh, this walk, there's a, a, a small little uh, dock and it's called Wedding Point. And I thought, why is it called Wedding Point? And I talked to a few people. They said, well, some couples here get married here and they have the ceremony at Wedding Point on the dock. Well, one morning we were anchored right in front of Wedding Point. And lo and behold, we saw a wedding. And there they came fully dressed. The... Uh, uh, the, the, the groom had the full uh, tuxedo on and the bride had the, the full white dress along. And, and then there was the, the uh, minister doing the ceremony. And then after that was done, the two of them plunged into the water with all their clothes on, the tuxedo and the white wedding dress. <laughs> that was the baptism, I guess. And then they crawled out of the water, soaking wet, and everyone cheered them on. So... <laughs> that was really quite an experience. This is another anchorage, and we're just walking through the trails here. You can see the, the boats uh, spaced apart nicely. Uh, I think they're in marine balls, and if I got close to the shore, I'd throw in an anchor. You have to watch your swing because a mooring ball doesn't have much of a swing, but an anchorage, I'm putting down a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, road for safety. Relaxation time after you finish swimming and climbing up the Gee Trail and so on, you just relax for a while. And there's lots of uh, times to just take in the scenery and 
uh, live the life of Riley. <laughs> there I am now. After some of my walks, I'd go there and just stare at the sea. I used to call it uh, sea staring. And I got in that hat one morning because I used to get up at six while my wife was sleeping and that was sunrise there. Uh, initially, I would get up and bring some magazines to the cockpit. But after a while, I decided not to read when I got up. And I'd sit on the bow just staring at the sea. And what was interesting is I just, this day after day, kind of mindfulness practice, but I didn't have any label for it. I really started to enjoy that, that connection I was making. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a kind of um, hard to put it in words, but the mind was so quiet, the sea was so vast, and I felt such a connection to it. And I would just stare and stare, and it, it would uh, just bring me into a peaceful state of mind. And then I get up again and get back to a normal life. But I must admit, uh, the sea taught me a lot about just connecting uh, with the, the beauty and the presence of this mass body of water. So you, you can see why I've structured the talk this way, because you'll understand the experience I had when I heard about September the 7th, 2017, about the hurricane. This is hammock time, and uh, right there. And then hurricane came, and there's wind dancing. And there are about 300 boats in the yard, most of them completely destroyed. We didn't know, I didn't get this photograph till later. For the first two months, there were aerial photographs only. So we didn't know where our boat was in the aerial photograph. We had no idea of the damage because they locked the yard. Uh, none of the insurance agents could get into the yard. They were worried about liability. They're worried, of course, if you, you moved one thing, there'd be a, a domino effect and everything go tumbling all over the place again. So there was a lot of concern. So the insurance agencies didn't get in there till about uh, two and a half months later. And uh, only they were let in, and they started to examine the damage of the boats and make assessments. But still, it's very, they couldn't get on the boat. Or, uh, and there were wires and shrouds all over the place and debris. And our dinghy, which is the boat takes uh, glass thing, it, it got smashed in half. And uh, the side of the hull got punctured, and the masts were destroyed, and everything else. Uh, it just was. Uh, and that's the picture we eventually saw, but that's all we had, all the information we had about three months later. And then a friend of mine, Jim, he went down to the island because he has his home there, wanted to see what damage was the home. So he finally made it into the yard and he went into our boat and it was, uh, it was completely, completely wrecked. And two things, they're both category five hurricanes, Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Marina. And uh, they both hit uh, the uh, Virgin Gorda, uh, uh, the eye of the hurricane hit there. And that's why the whole yard was uh, destroyed as well. Much of Virgin Gorda itself, the houses were all flattened. Uh, the electric system, the telephones, everything was down. Uh, we're very close to Puerto Rico. You must have read the same hurricanes hit Puerto Rico. They're about a half hour flight from, from um, uh, British Virgin Islands. And there are 3,000 people killed in Puerto Rico with uh, Hurricane Irma. Uh, the VDI has a much smaller population. It's all population. There's about 30,000. Uh, they had around, uh, uh, I think the injuries are in the hundreds. That was about it. But uh, Puerto Rico much larger and 3,000 that uh, got killed and then the damage to Puerto Rico. Still think they're rebuilding. And the BVI today is still in the process of rebuilding. It's a long process because the economy got devastated too. So there wasn't, uh, there wasn't the funds to really do a quick re rebuilding of the island, but it's uh, slowly getting back on its feet. I'd like to show you a video now that uh, captures uh, the feelings that uh, we developed over 15 years about what it felt like in terms of our, the inner beings that we are uh, uh, cruising uh, uh, in, the, in the Virgin Islands.
We were born before the wind Also younger than the sun Yeah, the bonnie boat was one As we sail into the mystic Oh, I can now hear the sailors cry Smell the sea and feel the sky Let your soul and spirit fly into the mystic Where that foghorn blows, I will be coming home. Mm. Yeah, when the foghorn blows, I want to hear it. I don't have to fear it. Suddenly we will fold into the mystic You know I will be coming home Yeah, when that fog horn was so close I gotta hear it I don't have to fear it And I wanna rock your gypsy soul Just like way back in the day Together we will go into the mystic. Come on, girl. What I liked about that video and what happened to me, immersing myself with my relationship to the sea, is his refrain, smell the sea and feel the sky. I got to the point where I, I used to see the sky, but after those three and a half years being on the sea, I would feel the sky, another opening of my senses and awareness. and. So I had a real visceral experience of feeling the environment I was in rather than seeing it. That was a profound shift uh, for me in uh, my years at sea. So you can see the effect that September 7th, 2017 had when we heard the news. I'd like you to reflect on this. I could read it for you if you like. I'll put on my reading glasses. Twenty years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things that you didn't do than by the ones you did do. So throw off the bow lines, sail away from safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sail, Explore, dream, discover, Mark Twain. And I'm so glad that 
15 years ago, we made that decision. And it's one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. It opened up a whole new chapter that I was aware of and was just not selling, but it opened up this new awareness of nature. And when I think of it, our closest neighbors were fish. They were always under our boat. And what I liked about fish, they had no political or religious agenda. They were just happy being fish. And it reminds us that we have to be happy being homo sapiens. It's a gift, a gift of life that we've been given. So now we're coming to the aftermath. What happened after 2017? Well, the first year, our children and grandchildren thought we should get together in March over in Spain. And that was the school break for the two grandchildren. So we all gathered over in Spain. They could only stay for 10 days, but we stayed there for uh, three weeks more. And we had one friend there. But I found after three weeks, after the grandchildren and my daughters left, that uh, I'm not much of a sightseer. And I kept contrasting the life we used to live. And so I was really anxious to get home. I thought there's more interesting things I could do at home rather than just going to another restaurant and going to another restaurant and, and visiting a couple of museums. Uh, it just wasn't cut out for me. And part of it, I kept contrasting to 15 years of living in this magical environment down on the sea. In any event, uh, we slowly dealt with that and had a great time uh, with the uh, school break and lots of adventures in, in uh, Nurha. Nurha, a small fish, uh, fishing village in Spain, population 22,000. And uh, just a great little Spanish village. Well, the next year we were confronted, what are we gonna do this year? So we, I thought, well, we'll get away. Let's try hooking up with friends we hadn't seen in 20 years. They lived in Ottawa and he'd worked at Nortel and they got a job down in Atlanta, Georgia. And it turns out they have a place in Barbados. So we got in touch with them after 20 years of not really losing touch. We just want you to come visit down in Barbados. So we thought, let's go for a little while. And so uh, we went down for, I think, five weeks. And um, my other daughter with her, my seven-year grandson, they spent 10 days with us too. But again, while I'm sitting at a the marine having food with our friends, I keep looking at the sailboats out in Anchorage and saying to myself, well, that's where I want to be. I don't want to be sitting here in a restaurant. I want to be out there. But anyway, you see these little apes would play and so on. And, uh, and I thought, well, I, I, I'm getting a little bored with just sightseeing in restaurants after restaurants. I, I'll be glad to get home. A lot of things I do at home, I have my friends, my community interests. And of course, then there's total mobility we're, we're under the, the uh, restrictions of a pandemic. So you're free to move around all winter and the winters weren't too bad. And so the following year, I thought, well, I can't go on another uh, land lover holiday. I'm not a land lover. If I'm on a holiday, I've got to be on water. So what happened? I said to Keish, you know, two weeks on a chartered sailboat is worth six weeks on land and the cost about the same. So let's do a, a, a two week charter on a boat down the Grenadines. We'd always wanted to do the Grenadines. So I booked it in February. And now we're talking about uh, year 220 where they're talking about the pandemic, but nothing really happened. Well, by March, it was happening all over the place, right? And in Ottawa. And then I, I checked with St. Vincent's and they were getting some cases down there. So the beginning of March, we canceled our our two week uh, charter and uh, they returned the refund. I was very grateful for that. And so here we are uh, now in uh, 2021. And so what I've 
decided. In 2022, I'm making our plans. 2022, we're going to charter a boat in the Grenadines. <laughs> That's what we're doing. We really miss it. Now, it's interesting when you look at loss in your life, there are many processes that you go through. Elizabeth Kubler Roth had five stages she dealt with in terms of loss the initial shock, uh, bewilderment, and so on, um, followed sometimes by all kinds of emotions. They're not always in the same place at the same time. And then there's recognizing the problem and dealing with the sadness or the depression about having, we lost a lifestyle, not a boat. We lost a whole lifestyle, a whole cultural way of being. And so that was very difficult for us. And so what we've done in, in this process, we really are at a point in our lives where we've let go of our story. <laughs> At the end of her story, it was a gift from the universe those 15 and a half years. We are so grateful universe for those 15 and a half years. And, but we are gonna do a charter down there in 2021. Hopefully things will be settled down by then. But it was a long process. It took us, I think, uh, two years of, uh, of stop watching, looking at, magazines of boats for sale, looking at YouTube videos about boats and cruisers and so on. And uh, so we've got more balance in our life now, but it, it took us, uh, I think, uh, about two years to fully get over it and let go of the story. And, uh, and then at the same time, part of letting go of the story, I thought how grateful it is we had those 15 years. It was a gift from the universe. Uh, so we're very thankful and it's a chapter in our life we'll never forget. And what I'd say to, to all of you watching, if, and it's hard, difficult times we're in now, but uh, this should all settle down in a year and you can start following your dreams and what you'd like to do at this point in your life. And uh, uh, there are many, many uh, dreams that we all have, they're all different, but the important thing is to follow your, your dream. And I remember coming back, I want to share this with you. When we were on the airplane coming back, we spent four minutes in the BBIs getting our, our uh, experience and our confidence built up. I was on the airplane, I said to Keish, at that time in the 60s, if it happened when I got back, I was told, you've got a serious illness, Mr. Riley, you have to get hospitalized. I could sit in the hospital and just remember those four beautiful months where I realized my dreams cruising in the British Virgin Islands. And I thought, and every year afterwards, I used to think, well, now this is bonus time because the first year was the great gift. And I was so grateful that we made that uh, uh, decision. So I'm wondering, uh, Park, if some point we're going to have questions. Uh, how is this working? Yes, uh, Rod, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we all appreciated that. Uh, both uh, your lifestyle uh, before and uh, unfortunately what happened during the uh, period of time that uh, the hurricanes went through and now the uh, recovery. So uh, as you've said, uh, you have many fond memories and hopefully you're continuing to make some of those memories now um, as we continue uh, uh, last year and this year with Life of Riley, your new boat here in the <laughs> Absolutely. Sailing Club. Absolutely. I'm going to continue living the life of Riley. There's so many other enterprises you can get involved in and I I've got a couple of them I'm doing right now during this uh, social distancing uh, uh, restriction we have. So uh, working on a couple other activities, but I'm gonna keep those as a surprise for everybody. Very good then, uh, Rod. Um, I made a mistake earlier when I told the audience that they should use the chat function to uh, pose their questions. Uh, better still would have been to use the Q&A function which is at the, uh, probably the, on your uh, Zoom menu. So uh, if there are any uh, questions uh, 
uh, please go ahead and use that function and uh, I'll put them to uh, Rod. And uh, I guess question that has come up here on uh, chat was uh, related to uh, some of the overhead things that you have to do when you're away in a place like that. Um, silly things, but necessary things like how do you get water for your boat? Uh, how do you get uh, uh, provisions and uh, even silly things like going to the laundromat? Uh, <laughs> well, you start to find out where the best laundromats are, uh, where the best provisioning is, and depending what uh, island you're anchored at. For example, we anchored a lot in Norristown at the Bitter End Yacht Club. They had a, a ferry going back and forth to the main island. It was free. Uh, you could go on at any time. So we would... Uh, get out of the boat, ride the dinghy over the dock, wait for the ferry to come, free ferry. We'd go over, it was about a maybe short ferry ride, 10 or 15 minutes, go over to the other island where there's a grocery store because there was very few provisions on, uh, on the bitter end itself. And, uh, but we only had a 45 minute window because you had to get back on the return ferry. So we moved fast in that grocery store and got back for the return ferry uh, 45 minutes later, and then we lug the uh, bags and bags of stuff we had to our dinghy and uh, motor back to the boat. And, and then Keish would be up in the cockpit and I'd hand her all the stuff. A couple of times I did lose my balance, went into the water, handing her some heavy items, <laughs> but I got better at it later on. That's, uh, that's the whole provision. It, it, it changes from which islands you're at, and some islands, there's no provision, so you want to make sure you're provisioned. Now, as far as water, uh, we have our storage for water was very short, uh, our capacity. And so, what we did is we uh, bought the five gallon jugs, and we had 20 of them in the boat. So, we would fill up with 20, and that was our drinking water. So, we'd fill up with 20 uh, gallons of uh, uh, water that we got from a filtration unit. And we would store them underneath the, uh, the settee in the cabin. And that would last us three weeks. And our uh, boat water, which was only 20 gallons, we would just use to wash dishes and so on. So that's how we handle it. Everyone handles it differently, the, the water supply. And, and they're all the different islands down in the British Virgin Islands have uh, different uh, services. If you're on the mainland, which is Tortola, uh, there's emergency services with doctors and there's pharmacies and everything else. So you, you, you do have to plan ahead. Then there's the immigration issue, which was a pain in the butt, but they'd only give you a 30 day stay and you had to go and renew your uh, permit to stay another 30 days. The problem with that is you had to go to the main island and then there was a big lineup and it'd take you maybe two or three hours just to get that extension for another 30 days. So one year uh, when I landed in uh, Spanish town, I said to the immigration officer, I said, you know, I come down here every year for the last 10 years. I'm here for three months. It's difficult for me sometimes because of sea conditions and storms to go in for the renewer for 30 days. And I provide a lot of uh, employment for the people here, restaurants, the yard work and so on. So I actually contribute to your economy. I'm not just a sailor sailing through. I live here. I don't go out of the British Virgin Islands. I don't go down south or anything. I live on your island. So he didn't say anything. I left and when I got out of the office, I looked at it. <laughs> I was good for three months. I said, look at this key. She's given us three months. <laughs> he didn't say anything. He just stamped it for three months. That was really great. <laughs> One thing I found down there, sure. you have to be very, very cordial and polite. And you, you don't use hi and hello. It's always good morning, good afternoon with all staff, waitresses and everything. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. They're very proper about language. They don't want, hi, how are you? That doesn't cut any ice. 
So you always have to be very polite with the language you use. Okay, Rod, thank you very much. Um, I have a question here about how did you get, could you say a few words about getting your boat down to the BBIs? Well, that was something else. <laughs> here I'm in panic mode, I bought the boat, right? And we were getting ready, uh, we brought it uh, up the St. Lawrence. I went through about 11 locks to get it to Collins Bay Marina in Kingston. And that was a trip in itself. I thought I'd never want to do that again. It was cold weather. It was 12 degrees every day. I had my park on and gloves and rain. It was just a miserable trip. But in any event, uh, we had to uh, get our windlass and get all the bimini work done with uh, uh, Genco. They shipped it all to Kingston. So we had a lot of work to do to prepare it for uh, getting it down for the following year. And I didn't know how I was going to do it. So I was looking, maybe I can get a captain to help us get down there. And I had no idea that someone mentioned a boat delivery company called Dockwise. And I inquired about it and it turned out it was a, a Dutch uh, uh, boat delivery, yacht delivery company. Uh, and then they'd opened a new outlet in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. And it was the same price as they had from their location uh, down in uh, Florida. And the boat would be down there in five days. And I thought, well, I think I'm going to go that route. Because it, since it was an introductory offer, the price was probably less than what it would have taken me to go down the ICW and then sail down to the Virgin Islands and take you know three months. So we brought the boat down to Newport. It was put on the ship, and five days later it arrived in St. Thomas. I had to go back home. We drove back home. I flew down by myself and met my friend Jim in St. Thomas, and then we got the boat off of Dockwise. And it's a floating dock, that's how it works. So what happens, they drain all the water out in the boat and you're all in cradles, right? They have the three dimensions before uh, you uh, are put on a, the uh, boat location. And uh, slowly the boat fills, just like clocks. And it took about an hour and a half to fill. And then they, on the VHF name of the boats, you're next, you're next until the front ones got off first and the ones in the back. I got it in the middle time. And you just motor it off. Well, what a great feeling it was to see the bow, white bow, contrast it with turquoise rot water rather than brown water. <laughs> You're home, baby. You're home. <laughs> well, very good there, Rod. Uh, there's a couple questions here about uh, did you ever have a drink at Willie T's? And I'm not familiar with that. Uh, Willie, yes, I've had a drink there. I've had a drink at most places in the, in the uh, BBIs. And, uh, and uh, I found, uh, I found the, the best place. Uh, I became a, um, a connoisseur when it came to uh, the killer uh, drink, uh, the uh, drink, uh, the painkiller. And so, I used to compare them, and I found the best island, if you're into painkillers, was Peter's Island. They made the best painkiller of any of the islands. So uh, every island's noted for some of the bartenders and so on, what great drinks they make. I never was a drum, rum drinker, by the way, till I took up sailing, because my friend who introduced me to sailing was a rum drinker. And it took us three days to get the boat from St. Thomas over to uh, uh, British Virgin Islands. And uh, during the evening, we, we don't drink in the daytime rounds for boat, but after we're anchored and everything is settled, we'll have a shot of rum. And I got hooked on rum. <laughs> got to like it. So, well, that's good. That's the drink of the Caribbean, I think. Now, yes, it's so inexpensive and so good. <laughs> uh, what were your four favorite anchorages? Well, I would say certainly North Sound, the Bitter and Yacht Club. Uh, Norman Island, we really like Norman Island. They rebuilt Norman Island. Uh, I would say then the third, um, Marina Key. And of course, our favorite restaurant was Marina Key. And it had a great connection, you see, with um, with uh, Trellis, which is right next to Marina Key. And there's a lot of things going on in Trellis. And there's an artist in Trellis there. 
uh, who's well known for his artwork. Plus he was well known for importing uh, all kinds of groceries and had all these fresh groceries. So we used to like just taking the ferry over there and picking that up. And I think then the fourth one might be, uh, let's see, of those, uh, we like Norman, we liked, uh, oh, we, the, the other place we enjoyed very much was a, a very small resort. And the name escapes me for a, a minute, but the water was such a unique color uh, at this uh, resort area, a smile island. And uh, that we would stay there for a few days, not too long because it wasn't a protected anchorage, but it was such a charming island and such a charming place to swim and snorkel in too. So we'd meet there quite often, but we wouldn't stay too long. So basically it was those three that we would stay, uh, you know, three weeks or so, Norman Island, uh, Marina Nikki and uh, uh, North Sound where the Bitter Edge Yacht Club is. Okay. One of the questions that came in here, I don't know whether it was a euphemistic question or what, but uh, basically saying that now when you sit on the bow of Life of Riley and look out over the Ottawa River, you still get the same sorts of feeling that you had about the water here in Ottawa versus the sea <laughs> uh, in the Caribbean. Well, that's a good question. Uh, that's a good question. You must realize we weren't there in a two day, two week or two month charter. We had over three and a half years living in water. So the contrast is quite striking to say the least. Yeah. Um, but uh, what I would say, and my wife, by the way, grew up in the Bahamas, right? She came here when she was 18. And so she was used to Turkish water. First thing she said, the water here is all brown. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> anyway, so, so uh, but I got to love uh, that beautiful turquoise water. So the, the water for me here now is, is brown. I never thought of it as a brown water until I was pointed out many years ago. That's what the color is. But I will say, if I'm on Life for Riley, for example, if I go to the uh, our slip, and have some people over on the slip for some drinks and something to eat. After a while, they'll say I had friends visit from the BVIs uh, up to Ottawa, and they'd say, we feel like we're back in the BVIs, right? We're, out, we're on a slip here. Uh, we have the restaurant, we have the food. So uh, on a slip, uh, we would uh, uh, get the feeling that this is just like the BVIs. But sailing wasn't quite the same way. Uh, <laughs> I don't but, doubt that at all, yes. Sailing is not quite the same. Um, I had to learn all sorts of interesting things like what's a tide table and what are tides. Yeah. So on and so forth. Um, but one of the reasons we, 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 we got the boat, we wanted to turn it into a family boat. Uh, we had grandchildren interested in sailing as they grew up sailing and so on. But then we realized our grandchildren now with all their studies are too busy to uh, really spend a lot of time uh, taking up sailing. So we may wait for many years for that, but we felt kind of selfish. We were gone for three months and there's no boat in Ottawa that uh, some of our friends and, uh, and family can uh, use. So we got it more for that reason so we could share it. And a lot, I brought a lot of my friends out who had never sailed before. And uh, I enjoy doing that. If someone wants to go sailing and run a sailboat again, I bring them out. I just ask them, do you know how to swim? <laughs> One question that came in here uh, is about your Bayfield 32. Yes. So, uh, if you were starting all, all over again, uh, is there what type of boat would you get? Would the Bayfield 32 be the one that would have filled your needs again? Or well, would you look at something else. Well, interesting question, because I would get a 40 footer. And that has to do with the, the length of the crests of the waves down there. Uh, and, and most of them, if you have a 40 foot boat, you're riding top of two crests. But if you have a 32, you're going to roll through it up and down. 
So a 40 or 42 boat is going to give you a better ride in, 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 in turbulent waters, for sure. Calm water is no different. And so for, for that reason, I would probably pick a, a, a 40 foot boat. My, my dream boat would be the Passport 40. I love that boat. And uh, we almost bought one down before the hurricane. We met this lady who was sailing her Passport 40. We got quite interested. We were thinking of buying it. We just loved the boat. And um, good thing we did in a hurricane next year, destroyed all the boats. But we hesitated. And when we thought we were going to make an offer, we phoned down to the uh, sales rep and been sold two days earlier. A beautiful boat, but we always almost made that switch. Okay. Um, but I recommend if you're down, you're going to do serious sailing, I recommend at least a 40 foot boat. Yeah, one of the problems you get when it gets too big is that if it's you and your wife, you can't control a boat that's maybe 50 feet. Uh, you have, to have lots of friends. <laughs> Yeah, hard to say. I chartered a boat once and many of the family came down for a week and I said, there's not enough room. So I chartered the 42 uh, Barbarian, had two steering wheels and everything. But I found it so easy to maneuver, much easier than my 32 boat that has the long keel. Uh, it's just a nightmare backing into a slip. But I, I found the new modern boats uh, uh, quite easy to handle. If you're getting in modern boat, I think the Benetos, you can't beat the Benetos. They're a good all around boat. Uh, lots of parts around, nicely designed. And, and since there's so many around, you can get a good buy on them. Right. Um, one question that came in about weather reports, and they're not talking about the hurricane because of course you were cold <laughs> when that hit. But day to day, where do you get your weather reports? Do you just listen to the net down there? Yeah, there was a humorous uh, weather announcer down in the BBIs, and we always liked the guy. At the end of his weather forecast, he always ended it with this refrain, whether you do or whether you don't, always depends upon the weather. <laughs> he always ended the forecast with that. So one thing we found about the BVIs, uh, very different from Lake Ontario, where uh, a storm can, can come up from nowhere. The, the forecasts are very predictable, the, the trade winds, and the trade winds are very predictable. If they say southeast at 15 to 20 knots for the next three days, that's usually what it is. Uh, the, it's very unusual that, uh, that uh, they make a mistake. But they have occasionally, you know, when um, a strange storm came in, came out from the west, which is not the usual route, right? So, right. but 90% of the time, the forecasts are great. So you don't get caught out. That's what I liked about the Virgin Islands. Uh, and my friend, by the way, who took up sailing at um, 18 years of age and uh, sailed all over Lake Ontario, and now he's been in the Virgin Islands for, uh, he spent six months down there for the last 15 years. He said, my two closest calls, Rod, in my sailing career were Lake Ontario. There were two occasions where I thought I wasn't going to make it. I just made it. I've never had that experience in the British Virgin Islands. Very good. So Very more good. friendly environment to sail in than Lake Ontario because of the predictability of the trade winds. Okay. Uh, one last question here. Uh, somebody has asked about uh, an anchorage, the Joost van Dyke anchorage. Have you ever been there? Oh, I've been to Joost van Dyke uh, many times, maybe a dozen times. And uh, it, it's famous for Foxy. You might have heard of Foxy. He throws his uh, gala New Year's parties. I've never been to him. And, uh, but it, it, it's a, it's a, I'm not fussy, it's not a favorite island for me, but uh, it's, a, it's a nice island, Yost Van Dyke. And there are anchor spots around there too. There's morning balls and anchor spots. Okay then. Well, I haven't been to that area. And so this gives me an opportunity, I guess, to uh, hear 
what uh, life was like down there over that period of time. So uh, I'd like to uh, thank you very much, uh, Rod, for sharing those experiences with us. And uh, hope you'll continue. Um, I think we said on the 8th of May, we're going to launch this year. So I'll make the prediction. Who knows what ha what's going to happen? Over the last four years, we've had two floods, COVID, <laughs> and um, a tornado. So, um, well, I've got the uh, maids down in my calendar already. And I want to thank you, Park, for all the support, and Sean for all the support, and Tony for all the support. Uh, I was really uh, frightened because the cyberspace is so foreign to me, but you guys held my hands and did such a great job. So I applaud you and thank you kindly. Thank you uh, again, Rod, and thanks everybody for joining in. And uh, appreciate uh, uh, the opportunity to uh, start these talks again. So, good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. And if you, ever you want to further the discussion, I'm at the Nepean's Sailing Club, uh, C76. And if you ever have questions, don't hesitate to visit our club and give me a call. And uh, we can chat, especially if you're planning to go down south.